What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Dominate the Diamond show. I'm Steve Nickerack here at Zone Sports Academy. And for the first time, you guys can see I'm going solo on, a, on our show this week. Coach Duke is away, so I will be here to uh, ask, uh, answer any questions you guys have. We have a bunch of topics. Um, this is our, actually our second week of doing our show on Mondays. We switch from Wednesdays to Mondays, and I personally love it. Uh, I call it like our weekend recap. You know, the weekend's fresh on our mind. Hopefully a lot of you guys got some wins yesterday. Um, you know, if you're anything like us, you probably have, you know, note sheets that look like this because we have so many notes on our on our teams and, and we're, we're looking forward to attacking them this week at practice. But before we get going, um, I see a couple people are already doing it, but make sure you leave where you're from and what age you're coaching. So uh, we know exactly how to how to tailor our ans answers specifically to you guys. Um, one topic we're going to cover today is moving up to the big field. So whether it's transitioning from 4660 to 5070, or even 5070 to 6090, we're going to talk about that transition as well. But um, whatever questions you guys have, it could be comments from the weekend, things that you saw on your team, um, you know, how to jump into practice this week. Um, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them today and, and, and look forward to jumping right into it. Um, we will start today with transitioning to the bigger fields. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys are doing that now, you know, going from t-ball and rookie up to kid pitch, um, from kid pitch up to, to minors, you know, making that jump from 4660 to 5070, and then the, the real big jump from 5070 to 6090. And that's something that I've witnessed a lot. You know, I've coached a lot of teams going from 12U to 13U, and, and that is a challenge, not just the field sides, but, uh, you know, mentally keeping the kids uh, having fun, keeping them engaged and, and loving the game because it is, it's a challenge in itself just making that jump. I think a few things that stick out to me, uh, you know, aside from just the distances, right? We're going from 46 feet to 50 feet, and then we're adding another, you know, 10 feet, six inches, going back to 60 feet, six inches. You know, the bases go from 60 to 70 to 90. Um, you know, the one huge jump is, is that throw from home plate to second base. It goes from 85 feet on the little field to 99 feet on the 50, 70 field, all the way up to 127 plus feet on the big field. So you're going to see coaches, there are a lot of challenges, um, you know, strictly maturity, kids growing, uh, kids not being able to make throws, hitters not being able to hit the ball out of the infield, you know, uh, I think you're, you'll see there's a drastic drop off uh, of, of kids that are, you know, Hit, hit puberty already they're mature they're big strong kids but they might be slow and then you might have a few kids on the team that are really fast but can't hit the ball past the pitcher and uh you know that's that's 13 u baseball for the first time that's jumping up to the bigger field it is a challenge um things that i always try to do i, I stay away from batting average i stay away from statistics um, and i really try to focus on quality at bats at that age you know there's kids that are going to be over for their first 10 but might have hit three or four balls hard but just aren't strong enough to hit it hit it to the outfield yet so you know that's one thing i always focus on um the pace of play is is, an, is another struggle it's it's so much slower uh, on the big field kids at 46 60 50 70 you know they're throwing hard there's action there's home runs then you move up to 60 90 and it takes kids forever to get down the first baseline. It takes balls forever to get to home plate. Kids can't hit it past the infield. So it's a lot of low scoring games, a lot of walks. It's a much slower game. So we have to make sure that, uh, you know, as coaches, we're, we're aware of that. And, and we take it easy on our teams. And, you know, we teach them real baseball for the first time because it's the first time they're ever going to be on the big field. So um, just being aware of that, being patient, um, you know, I love taking a stopwatch and, you know, timing a kid running from home plate to first base and actually showing how much time we have as a defense to make plays. I've never seen more kids get thrown out on base hits to center field or base hits to right field because it takes them six or seven seconds to get down the line. So outfielders are throwing guys out at first. But, uh, you know, as coaches, it's, it's important that we focus on the positioning. We focus on staying positive. We focus on, you know, quality at bats. You know, we, we tell our pitchers, let's focus on, you know, throwing to contact. Let's not try to throw for strikeouts. Let's make sure we throw to contact. Let kids put the ball in play. Um, you know, we don't have to go out and strike out 12 guys to be successful today. We have to make sure we, we fill up the strike zone. Um, you know, and then just overall as a team, we have to make sure we monitor their throws. Not just pitch counts, but monitoring how many throws they're making in infield, outfield, in between games. You know, that distance from, from shortstop to first base on a routine ground ball is like, a center fielder throwing a kid out at the plate on the smaller field. So there are really drastic differences making that jump up to the big field. Um, you know, cuts and relays are different. 
positioning. You're going to see more double and triple cuts on on the big field for the first time than than you've ever seen. But you know, you just got to take the good with the bad, and um, you know, do your best to attack it weekly and, and and try to teach these kids about the positioning and the fundamentals and you know, footwork and creating momentum into our throws. All of that stuff is so important. So if any of you coaches out there are making that jump to the 60-90 field and are seeing some of these struggles, be sure to be sure to leave your questions and comments in there. I think it's a, it's a fun age, but it's definitely a, a challenging age making that jump up to the big field. What do we got so far, Dom? We've got a, a lot of good comments coming in so far. Coach Glover, 9U, when throwing a ball down to second from the catcher position, do you have to wait for the ball to cross home plate before the catcher touches it for a throwdown, even the opposite batter's box of the batter? I mean, technically you can cheat, right? You can cheat, and as a catcher, you can kind of go out and get it, but I would be careful of a swing, right? There's a lot of kids, uh, you know, on, on pitch counts especially. You can see, I watched it uh, just last week in the, in the major leagues, there was a pitch count or a pitch out, and the catcher jumped out to try to get a cheat you know, a cheating jump on it to throw the runner out. But I would just be careful teaching our kids to jump too early because, you know, whether it's a hit and run or it's a, you know, a batter might be late and he makes contact with our glove, he's going to get first base. So we have to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we have good footwork, we create good momentum and good angles, but we don't want to cheat out too much. Um, again, if it's a pitch count, by all means, go ahead. If, if you got a right-handed hitter and we're pitching out into the left-handed batter's box and that catcher can get a good jump on it. But, uh, you see a lot of times kids, they jump up too early, they take that big crow hop, and, you know, God forbid a, a player swings, you know, aside from getting injured, um, we definitely don't want that catcher's interference call. But that, that's, that's a good question right there. Coach Chad's on there, Coach Dwight, Coach Brett. Um, what's that? Praying for another W tonight. I like it, Coach Brett. Um, Coach Adam. Do you have any drills that assist teaching my 11U pitchers with having a quicker pitch delivery? Our running game was shut down this weekend by a team whose pitcher was almost what I could call quick pitching. It's caught our runners off guard because they're barely getting their lead in time, and I was and was delivering all three of my faster players were thrown out. Thanks, Coach Adam. That's a, that's a great question. I had uh, my brother Mike on a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know he was talking about different. Um, Different pickoff moves, different times. Um, I think most players, especially at 11U, right? Like th these guys are probably pitching from the stretch for the first or second year with with, with runners leading. So I think it's important important to try to add in maybe three different pickoff moves or three different times to home plate. So you know, for instance, if I'm a pitcher and I get on the mound, Dom, can you just tilt this camera up for me? You know, I might have three three different moves. So I might have you know my first one. Which would, be, which would be my quick move or my A move, where I come set and I have quick feet and a quick throw. That's my, my best move, that's my A move. Now my B move might be come set, maybe give a one second hold, I step off slow and then make that throw. And then the third one could be coming set, doing a three second hold, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, and then I can either pitch or step off. But I think it's important that, that your pitcher's changing up his times, right? He's not just, you know, kids will get a running start when they come set, one Mississippi, and then pitch every time. Coaches and players can get a feel for that, and they can get a feel for the timing. So making sure that we switch that up. Sometimes we come set, we give a quick pause, and we deliver the pitch to home plate. Sometimes we give a bad move just to show them that we're thinking about them, and then we can even do the three second hold. I also think that it's important um, that, that we incorporate some sort of a slide step or a modified slide step to work quicker to home plate. And what I mean by that, instead of the traditional, we come set, we have a big high leg kick, and we deliver the, the pitch to home plate, we can add in a modified slide step. Now you gotta be careful, especially at, at the younger ages, because kids will jump towards home plate and then their arms playing catch up. So I like to call it a modified slide step, which just means when I come set as a pitcher, my feet are going to be a little bit wider than they normally would. And what I'm going to do is more of a knee to knee move. So when I come set here on the mound, maybe I give a one second hold. And then instead of a leg lift, I'm going to do a modified, modified slide or modif modified stride. I'm sorry. So it's just knee to knee. I'm still getting loaded back and I'm making sure that I get my arm up in time to throw the ball home. Too often kids, they come set and they try to be so quick that they just slide to home plate, their front foot hits, their arms playing catch up, you know, you're going to lose velocity, you're going to lose location, 
and it's going to be counterproductive. So I think adding in that modified slide step is huge, as well as adding in a few different pickoffs to first base. Ho hopefully that helps, Coach Adam. Let's see. Coach Tyson, four games in, and I've really seen a lot of my outfielders look slow in games. Oh, I just lost it for a second there. Taking fly balls, they look great in practice. And in warm-ups, we have coach being ready every pitch, but in games they look just slow, too slow to react. How can I simulate game fly balls in practice? Coach Tyson, that, that is a good one. Um, aside from, you know, just trying to get them quicker, you know, I, I, I love doing agility ladder stuff. I love doing speed ladders and hurdles with, with our outfielders just to work on their first step quickness. It sounds like your guys are just not getting – not getting great jumps in game. They're not getting good reads off the bat. Um, they're probably not taking the correct angles, you know, and they're just drifting to the ball. So uh, one thing I talk, I talk about it every week, I would try to do as much simulated, uh, simulated game stuff at practice as you possibly can. You know, if that means having a pitcher on the mound throwing live to your hitters, it might be a pitcher that doesn't get an opportunity to pitch that much, but getting him in there, throwing some live pitch, uh, pitches, just to get some reads off the bat for your outfielders. Uh, most kids, and I'm sure your guys do it too, we, our, our teams do it at the younger ages, they just go out and shag fly balls during infield outfield. There's 15 outfielders out there. Nobody's really working on anything other than probably trying to catch it and throw it into the bucket. So what I try to do, especially as the guys get older, is make sure they go out to their position, they're always working on their prep step, and they're always working on getting those good reads. Um, you watch uh, you know, Major League Baseball, even college baseball, there's a, a, even during batting practice, coach pitch batting practice, the defense is out there, they're working on their prep step, and they're working on their first step quickness. And, and what I mean by that, again, I'm not going to make Dom fix the camera, but they're going through their prep step, and regardless of whether or not the ball's hit to them, they should always be moving in a certain direction. You can always tell a good fielder by, by the way they react when the ball's not hit. If your outfielders are out there in, in BP and their feet hit like this for their prep step, the ball's hit and they don't move, Right? I might be playing left field and the ball's hit to right field. Even if the ball's not hit to me, I should still have that first little jab step towards left. Or my infielders. You know, I go through my prep step and I do a little quick drop step depending on where the ball's hit. But you can always tell good infielders and good outfielders by the way their feet move when the ball's not hit to them. Right? So making sure that during BP or like I mentioned earlier, a live kid pitch scrimmage or a simulated game in practice is just a great way to work on getting those reads work on getting those those live jumps because it's it's tough to simulate it having a coach hit a fungo you know or you know throw fly balls working on drop steps those are those are great those are great for drill work and for practice but to get them locked in on getting good reads off the bat you know reading bad contact hearing bad contact as opposed to just having a coach hit those fly balls i think that's going to be the difference maker and then i touched on earlier just Speed ladder, hurdles, stuff like that. I love it. Um, you know, again, it's just working on their agility and their quickness. So, Coach, I hope that helps. Let's see. Coach Jason, thank you. Um, no question, just wanted to thank you guys for the tips you gave me for my nine-year-old son on his hitting and his pitching. He had the best game so far this year. Yesterday, going four for six with five RBIs and three innings pitched. Awesome, Jason. Happy to hear it, man. We're we're happy to help and. Hopefully there's a lot of you guys out there that are getting some, some good feedback and little tidbits to take back to your team. Um, let's see. Coach Dwight, we'll be getting into outdoor practices soon. And different uh, in-game defensive situations is something we need to work on. Do you have any different types of drills to suggest we work on this? We are in the same boat, Coach Dwight. You know, we, uh, we've been inside all winter. We're up in, in New Jersey, and we've been inside trying to simulate those situations as best as possible. But those in-game situations that uh, you need to work on, you know, I think rundowns are huge. I think getting outside and being able to do pop fly communication is huge. Getting out there, uh, you know, first and third defenses, bunt defenses, those are just to name a few. Um, but I think just getting them out on the field, getting them acclimated. I remember being in college, and the first time I put my, my cleats on were opening day because we were inside the entire winter practicing. We were on turf, and then we got outside. And, you know, it's a different game, just seeing the ball fly in the air, trying to get live reads off, live reads off the bat, which I, I was just mentioning to Coach Tyson. But, um, you know, I think first and thirds are huge. I think uh, base running is huge because 
you might have been able to do it inside, do it on turf or, or in a basketball gym, but it's different when we get our cleats on. So base running, first and thirds, bunt defenses, cuts and relays is, is a big one. Um, you know, not just being able to make the play, but making, making sure that they're positioned correctly. So, you know, simulate, ha have a runner stand on home plate, hit balls over the outfielders' heads, and just see how they move. Uh, you know, I love it because you can, you can stop practice, you can move players around, you can get a dry erase board and actually draw up cuts and relays and where players are supposed to go. Cuts and relays, rundowns, you know, and then, and then the more you get into that, you know, one thing I always do, and I mentioned it again earlier, I always have the, the players that don't always pitch on the weekends, I have them throw at practice. I let our hitters see live pitching outside. I let our defense see live reads off the bat. I don't think there's anything better than, uh, you know, getting the, you know, simulate real baseball. It's like in spring training, you know, they have a couple days of, of practice every week leading up to it. But then as they get closer to the games, they're doing simulated games. They're seeing uh, live arms on the mound, batters are in the batter's box. Not only are they seeing the pitching, but pitchers are getting used to seeing hitters in the batter's box. The defense is getting the live reads. Um, and I think that'll give you a lot of, uh, of information about your team specifically on what you need to work on. Just one thing that I always do, aside from taking notes during the game, I'll, I'll watch those simulated games at practice and, and uh, you know, it's instantly creating my practice plan for the following week. I think, I think it's something that, uh, you know, benefits everybody on the field, e e even us as coaches. So that's, that's a great question, Coach Dwight. I hope I helped. Coach Michael, do you think 12U fastball, softball, is it too late for my daughter to learn to pitch? I don't think so. I don't. Um, you know, I did not grow up playing softball, but I think, uh, you know, if, if, if your daughter's a good athlete and, uh, and, and she wants to try it out, I don't think there's anything wrong with being 12 years old and, uh, and taking up pitching. You know, I, I would try your best to find a, a good quality pitching instructor that, uh, that you trust and maybe, you know, ha has some, some good recommendations heading her way and, uh, or, or his way and do your best to maybe learn the basics at first. But, you know, she's, she's 12 years old. She's young. I think she's got plenty of time to develop and, you know, it might be something she loves or something she doesn't love. I had a, a softball lesson. Actually, I still do. I've had her since she was eight years old and, uh, she's now 16 and she went through a little spur where she wanted to try pitching and that, that ended quickly. She could throw really hard, but didn't really know where it was going, but it was something she just wanted to try and she was a good athlete and she actually got okay at it. It was just, uh, you know, struggling with command. So coach Mike, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think it's too late to start. Definitely not. Let's see, Coach, Coach Miguel Reyes. Good morning from California. Thank you, coaches, for all your awesome help. I have a nine-year-old who sets up in the box really well. Dom, can you slide that over? I can't really see it. Uh, starts his swing from the ground up. It takes a good stride step, rotates the hips, swings aggressively, but then has a hard time swinging through the baseball. He pulls hits a lot. He's hitting a lot of hard ground balls to third. Is there a drill to help? something to do for him to understand his swing through the ball instead of slapping at it. Coach Miguel, really, really good question there. Um, I think a couple things come to mind without seeing your son on video. Um, two things that I would think of instantly. I love freezing at extension. I think that's a really good drill to, uh, to help players feel hitting through the baseball. So, you know, your batter, your, your son could be in the batter's box and he could take his, his warm up swings, whether it's off the tee or side toss or front toss and actually have him freeze right at extension. All right. So notice I'm, I'm palm up, palm down here. Most kids and, and what coach is talking about, what coach Miguel is talking about is his son's getting the contact really well, but then he's pulling across his body. So we want to make sure that we hit through the baseball, not, not, not just to hit the ball really hard, but to give ourselves more room for error. Right? This might be perfect fastball timing, but then if it's oh shoot, change up or curveball, we have to have that adjustability out in front of us to drive through the ball. So making sure that your son gets to contact, palm up, palm down, and then stays through contact, palm up, palm down. So you know, a good a good drill would be to freeze that extension right here. That would be uh, you know, drill number one I would do. Drill number two. I have a connection ball here. You can use a dodgeball. You can use a, a, a soccer ball. I love this one too because what this does is it forces the proper spacing between my body and my arm. Kids, when they start to hook balls or roll over, they tend to accelerate with this front side. And I'll do it this way for you. So they accelerate their front side and this is working straight across my body. So what this connection ball does 
is it creates that space and it kind of guides my front arm to work directly back at the pitcher. So it kind of guides that front elbow to work this way instead of this way. It's, it's one of my favorite tools. I, I use it all the time in lessons, but you kind of put it right here in the bicep forearm area. You have your son take swings and freeze right in here. And it'll actually, I'm going to rotate here. It'll actually hold right between, you know, his, his, his arms. So you can see it kind of looks like a triangle from my hands to my elbows. That's properly hitting through it. Um, you know, other things visually that I think might help would be to set up a target on the field or set up a target in, in the batting cage to think about driving the ball through the back net or through the top of the L screen. I think those are all, all really good things to, to, to practice. But I hope two of, those, two of those drills I do all the time, and I, and I hope, hope they both help for you. Let's see. Coach Salazar, how do you deal with younger players joining the team with older players? Their drive for playing is different from practice to game, meaning no fight in the game. That is a tough one. We actually, Coach, we talked about that last week about um, trying to in games separate the players, or in practice, I'm sorry, separate the players by their ability level or, or their skill level to make sure that um, they're working on things appropriate to them. So you don't want to always combine the best player on the team with the worst player on the team because if the worst player keeps messing up the drill, the better player is going to get bored. He's going to get tired of it. You know, he's not going to. He's not going to want to do it anymore. So we always try to push our guys in practice. So I'll take you know a group of maybe the four top players and work on things that they need to work on that day for you know a 30-minute circuit. I take our kind of middle of the pack group, work on things that they need to work on, and then maybe that beginner or younger group, those guys come in and maybe we're working on. And again, I'm not sure what age you're referring to here, but we work on things that are appropriate to them. So it might be as something as simple as learning how to catch with their fingers up versus, versus fingers down you know, basic mechanics in the hitting box or in the batter's box, working on things um, that are tailored towards their ability level, I think helps practice flow a, a bit quicker. Um, it, it keeps it going smoother. And you'll see those kids on the bottom tier of the team develop quicker. So now they're able to play in the game with those guys. You know, they're able to compete. They're able to receive throws. And I think uh, the, the better kids on the team are going to appreciate it as well, just because the, the younger guys are getting pushed and they're, and they're, developing at a quicker quicker rate than they would if they were out there with the best guys on the team. Um, you know, when you say their drive for playing is different from practice to the game, you know, they have no fight in the game. I don't know if that's, you know, referring, maybe they're just not that good yet and they're struggling. And that's always, that's always a challenge when kids are struggling and, you know, they're not having fun. Um, I, I would always try to tell my, my older guys on the team to do their best to, to pick them up, you know, be leaders, not just be leaders as the, as the best player on the team, but be leaders and be role models for the younger guys. Um, I actually had a girl, she's a, a high school softball player in two weeks ago, and she was talking about how young their high school team is. And she was saying, man, you know, it's me and one other player, everybody else is so young. So what I said to her was, be the, be the senior that you wish you had when you were a freshman. And, and what I mean by that is, be that leader, right? Even if you guys aren't gonna be that good, Right, that freshman's going to look up to you. She's probably showing up to tryouts. She's probably so nervous right now. So be the senior that you wish you had when you were a freshman. Just means, you know, the older players on the team, they're going to set the the expectations. They're going to, you know, they're going to work hard. They're going to lead by example. They're going to, you know, push push one another. But they're also going to pick up pick up the slack for for the younger players on the team that are struggling. So teaching them how to lead, as opposed to us as coaches always telling guys this is how we do things. Well, if our older guys and our leaders on the team show that this is how we do things. I think you'll start to see a little bit more of a, a, a culture being built amongst the players. You know, the, the younger players are going to start to play a little bit more free and loose, not so tight and nervous, because they know that the older guys on the team are going to pick them up, you know, both physically and emotionally. They're going to be there for them, you know, whether they're struggling, you know, whether they're in a slump, and they're, and they're going to lead by example. So, Coach, I hope that helps. That, that's a good question. And, again, I hope I reference your age-specific team there. Let's go to Coach Frankie Kramer. I've worked with my girls on putting their bodies in front of the ball when fielding, but if a ball is hit towards them but not quite there yet, they're afraid to dive and reach for it. We used the diving pads in practice, but they will not do it in a game. Any suggestions to get them diving and reaching for the ball when they need to? Um, 
you know what I always do I always use the di the diving pads and I always have our players start on their knees just to teach them how to dive properly and it sounds like your players do understand that um, what I would do is try your best to create a competition out of it in practice you know one one thing we like to play we call it crisscross applesauce and what we'll do is we'll have a line at third base and we'll have a line at shortstop and you know we'll set cones for where they have to start and I'll stand at home plate and I'll just hit rockets right in the in the five six hole right between third and short and and I partner them up and usually we'll put like a prize you know at, at the end of it so we have these fun championship belts that we we put the belts on and we tag them we post it on Instagram and and Twitter but uh you know whenever you put a competition on the line I think you're going to see your players work a little bit harder so what, what I do is I try to hit rockets right between third and short if the the player makes the play without diving that that's fine they're, they're still in if they dive and miss it they're still in but if they get beat without diving, they're automatically out. So they could dive, they can miss it, we'll call it a base hit, the same two go back up. But if you get beat without diving, or you dive and make the play and then make a bad throw, then you're out. And I think you'll start to see those kids push each other a little bit more. Um, they'll also start to trust the fact that, oh, I can dive, and it doesn't really hurt that bad. Um, but ball, ball should never drop without diving. I think that, that's a message you have to send your players that we're going to go all out on, on every pitch. But that's just one, one diving drill, Coach Frankie, that comes to mind for me that always helps. And uh, kids that don't want to dive, well, they also don't want to lose the competition. So, you know, they're going to start diving in practice. And before you know it, you know, that uh, mentality, I think it's just going to be uh, something that they're used to. And they're going to get into the game and they're going to want to lay out for the ball. Let's see. Coach Justin Mullis, two questions actually. Why are lefties recommended? Why are lefties not recommended as a catcher? Second, when bunting, do you suggest to get in front of the plate or staying at your regular spot in your stance? So I'll go with question one first. Why are lefties not recommended as a catcher? Well, I think a lot of the times, especially at the younger ages, there's a lot of a lot of righties, a lot of righty hitters. So you know that's just a, a one thing that comes to mind right and especially depending on what age you're coaching i see a lot of young catchers that are lefties so you know with a with a lefty catcher and a righty standing in the batter's box there's a ton of righties so that's probably uh you know step one the second one for me at least i would think i as a catcher and i'm a righty as i come up to throw the baseball i can kind of see the whole right side of the field here right i can see the first baseman stealing i can see him getting his steal break um and those are two things that come to mind right away. But to be honest, I see a lot of young catchers. I even saw a, a college catcher in softball just last week that was a lefty. So I'm not opposed to it. If there's a lefty out there that, that wants to, to try out catcher, by all means, you know, it's better than on one of our teams we had six lefties. So there was a log jam at first base in the outfield. So if it, if it, if it finds a way to get him in the lineup, by all means, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And then to answer the second question, question when bunting do you suggest getting in front of the plate or staying at your regular spot um, I always try to teach our guys to get up in the box a little bit right so we're still going to be in an athletic position but instead of our normal position I might move up on the plate which is going to allow me to have more coverage on the outer half and I might move up in the batter's box just to make sure that I'm bunting that ball out in front it's going to help me help me with angles making sure that I keep it fair but uh whether it's a you know especially in a sacrifice bunt situation I would get up on the plate move up in the box square early who cares if the whole field knows that we're bunting our job right there is just to make sure we advance the runners so i think it's it's two two good questions and i think for, for the bunting one i would definitely teach up on the plate let's cover the outer half and up in the batter's box i think it'll help with with off-speed pitches as well let's go up to coach adam with runners on first and second the other team bunted and my first and third guys crashed in that scenario should third have stayed in position in hopes to get the lead and are the plays always to one we're losing and had no outs thank you for all you do coach adam great question first and second nobody out um we always run a bunt defense uh you know you can call it whatever you want you can call it red white black but our third baseman is always going to be the hard hard read position there so what we do what we do is our first baseman crashes hard our pitcher crashes hard but our pitcher is also crashing towards the third base side our third base has a hard read, which means they're going to be up on the line. They're going to be up, you know, in front of the in front of the third base bag. They're going to be close to the foul line, and their only job is to read where that ball is bunted. Because if it's bunted hard right at them, then we have to go in. We have to make the play, 
and get the out at first. The, the, offense job, the offense's job there is to try to get the third baseman to field it. But again, at younger ages, kids don't really have the control yet, so they're bunting balls all over the place. The third baseman's going to hold. If, bunted, if it's a great bump by the team, third baseman's going to have to field it, get the out at first. If not, the pitcher's going to cover the third base side. The first baseman's crashing. Shortstop's covering second. Second base is covering first. And ideally, as a defense, we're going to try to get that force out at third base. Um, it's one of those tough situations that I think you have, to, you have to just work on in practice. You know, teaching your third baseman, you know, to read the pace of the ball, read the angle of it. Um, another thing is knowing who's the pitcher at that time, right? Because if I have a righty on the mound and he throws and he falls off to the first base side of the field, he's going to have a hard time covering, covering the right side. If I have a lefty and he's falling off, it might be a little bit easier. Also, lefties can field it and they're already facing the third, third baseman. Righties are going to either have to turn it into a backhand or pivot around the ball. Um, that's a tough one, but I think first and second, nobody out. Almost every team in the country wants to bunt, and they want to bunt the ball to the third baseman. So our job as a defense is to hold, hold our position as long as we can unless it's right at us. You know, if the pitcher fields it, or first baseman fields it, the catcher is kind of the quarterback out there, and he sees the whole field. He knows, you know, what kind of a jump did the runner on second get? How far is he from third base? Can we go three, 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 or do we just we just want to get the out at first and, and go one, one, one? But on the flip side, if you're bunting first and second, nobody out. Let's try to bunt that ball hard right at third baseman. Good, good question, Coach Adam. Let's see, Coach Brian, I got a ten-year-old. That constantly started stepping out while swinging and now locking his arm and reaching he's lost all confidence at the plate went from a top three hitter to the bottom three coach brian my question for you would be i don't know if maybe he got hit by the ball or he's afraid or you know he started seeing you know better pitching um a couple things that i do here is is i have a balance beam it's uh kind of like a two by six and i'll have players stand on that I'll use cones, I'll use lines, just something to get their body used to stepping directly and straight back at the pitcher. I think it's a struggle that a lot of kids go through, and especially at the younger ages, they get their, maybe they get hit once and they're afraid, or they're facing a fast pitcher and he's wild and, and they're bailing out, but getting them to get their feet set correctly in the batter's box is huge. Making sure we're stepping in a straight line, um, more so just to make sure we can cover the outer half of the plate and all of our direction is working back through the middle. Like you said, kids that step out, they're going to get in here, they're going to bail way out, and now they're reaching for everything. So ball's on the outer half of the plate. Instead of me getting to it and being here, if my body's falling backwards, same point of contact, I'm like this. Um, you know, you're bailing out, you're making poor contact. But uh, I'm not sure if it's a confidence thing, if it's something that maybe happened in the past, getting hit by the ball and, and he's afraid now. But um, I would definitely use things on the ground, use visuals for them. Um, we have the Miller mat that we use. We use, uh, a, a, like I said, a two by six. I'll put some cones. I'll put things right behind the hitter to make sure that, uh, that they can't step out. But I ho hope that one helps there. Coach Justin, let's pull up. Uh, he's going to add to that question that just got asked. At some point in bunt defense, does the catcher have to cover third? Yeah, okay, perfect balance up there. Um, definitely, and, and more, more times than not, the catcher is just going to be working towards third base just as a, you know, as a, as a backup as a, in, a, in a rundown situation. You know, if there's a runner on first base with, with nobody out and they bunt it at the third baseman and that third baseman crashes hard, well, a lot of times the pitcher, if he doesn't field the ball, will circle back around and cover third. But that, that catcher is always working up the line as well, just making sure that somebody's getting to the base. Because uh, you know, if the batter bunts one towards the third base side of the infield, pitcher crashes, third baseman crashes, shortstop goes to second, well, we advance the runner, but now nobody's standing on third base. That runner can just keep going. He can go right from first all the way to third base. So um, you know, one thing I always, I'll, I'll tell my pitchers first, just because I think it's a little bit easier of an angle. We're attacking the ball, a third baseman calls it, then we're going to peel off and, and go back towards third base. If they're both crashing in hard and it's that ball that's kind of bunted right in front of home plate, well, then it's the catcher's job to, to work up the line and, and get to third base. Good question, though. Um, let's see. Joey Bass, what's going on, man? With a runner on second, the pitcher has to cover the third. Okay, perfect. He answered that question for me. Thank you. Um, Coach Jim, what age do you recommend using the guards, elbow, ankle, chest, etc.? 
I think it's any age coach. Um, you know, there's, there's certain kids that get in that are fearless and then other kids that feel like they need to be in the full suit to be protected. And uh, I think it's all just a, a preference on, on the player. Um, I, I wore an elbow guard. Um, I wore like the Evo Shield elbow guard because I got hit in the elbow two times and that one hurt. I didn't wear the ankle one. I didn't really foul a lot of balls off my, my, my ankle. Um, the, the C flap on the helmet, I really do recommend. Um, when I was in the minors, I got hit by a 91 mile an hour fastball right here and it shattered 15 bones in my face and I had surgery and it, it was really rough for about a month there. Um, and then I went right to wearing it. So I got the C flap one pitch too late. So I would highly recommend if your kids are afraid, you know, get that C flap. Oh, there you go. Dom put a picture of it. Real nice, Dom, making me look good. Yeah, you can see the laces. So I wore it. Uh, I wore it one pitch too late, but that's one thing that um, I would recommend. I don't. It doesn't block your vision. It doesn't do anything, but you know, make you feel like you can kind of dig in and stay over, stay over the plate a little bit more. But it's all preference. You know, if if, if kids are a little bit afraid or they're bailing out and they want to wear the elbow guard, nothing wrong with it. Now I do think there, you know, there's too many nine-year-olds out there with the with the ankle guard, the elbow guard, the face guard. They have the hand guard in their back pocket now for for sliding because some of the major leaguers do it. Um, that's a little overkill, but I guess I guess it looks cool too. So looking cool is like 90% of it. Um, let's go with uh, let's go with two more questions here. Let's see. Oh, Coach Brian, he referenced his question before. He hasn't he hasn't been hit and he's not seeing any real fast speeds. Yeah, Coach Brian, just to get back to he was talking about his player bailing out of the batter's box. I would definitely use lines. I would definitely, you know, restrict him from moving his feet. Um, you could even have him do some no stride stuff. And what I mean by that is just get out to his launch position, you know, go heel up, heel down and just work on that and get used to keeping his feet in that straight line. Um, a lot of times too, it's, you know, for, for some kids it's approach when kids are really trying to yank the ball and pull it, they're going to bail out and try to cheat. Um, but if his, his approach is more gap to gap and in the middle of the field, it might keep his, his direction a little bit better through, through the middle. So hopefully those helped. Let's see. All right, we'll, we'll finish up with our boy Joey Bass. I have a great kid that has a tendency to feel the ground ball with the back, with the back of his hand on the ground instead of the fingers on the ground. How do I work on fixing that? Coach, that's a really good question. I actually brought my glove today. I was hoping we were going to get some fielding questions. I usually get a lot of hitting ones. So what Coach is referencing, I'll, I'll do it from the side here. He's saying that his, his player's fielding ground balls with the back of his glove on the ground like this, which kind of creates that ramp. So players, they'll field it, but then it, it kind of bounces all over the place. So what I'll always tell my fielders, I'm just going to stand up here, the angle's better, is to push the heel of their hand forward. So now instead of fielding the ball like this, where the glove's acting like a ramp. If I push the heel of my hand forward, now my fingertips are down and that ball's gonna stick in there as opposed to roll and work outside the glove. Now it's gonna stick. So I would, I would definitely say fingers down, right? Where, wherever we go, whether it's a forehand, it's a routine, or it's a backhand, the fingers of the glove are always gonna be down. So I would say push the, push the heel forward and then just let the fingers relax. So often kids wanna like pick through it and try to scoop it, but we wanna think almost like a, like a shovel, we're pushing back through the ball. We're not scooping up and under it. Um, I love using paddles. You know, we have the Valley training pads. You know, you can get the real simple foam ones, but just kind of preset them in that position where the heel of my hand is forward and I'm always working two hands. I'm always getting it out like this. We never want to scoop through. Hopefully those two help. I know we have a lot of stuff, um, and Joe, you've been with us for a while now on pick progressions, on bare hand pick progressions. I'm, I'm another big fan of just using the bare hand to get used to it. But, um, you know, I think pushing the heel of the hand forward is huge. It keeps them working back through the baseball as opposed to under and up. Good question, though. Coach Miguel, give him a Gatorade if he gets hit. I like it. Guys, thank you so much for joining. Um, you know, Coach Duke wasn't here this week. He'll be back with me next Monday. Um, you know, we had Ro making sure that um, she, she was adding in all of our links. So subscribing to our YouTube channel. Dom's done a great job at... Uh, really putting a lot of content on our YouTube channel. So um, our membership, free seven day, free seven day trial. Um, don't be afraid to, to, to jump on that and check it out. We have over 900 videos and uh, Dom and I are actually getting ready to go out and shoot our newest course, which is more tiered towards um, mental training, sports performance, 
um, how to handle players, you know, going through slumps or struggling with things and battling through adversity. So that's going to be our newest course. We're looking forward to it. There's going to be over 50 videos and we're getting ready to go shoot some more content right now. But thank you guys for joining. We will see you next Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Go out and dominate the week. Thanks, guys.